focus on my art for the last probably two and a half, three years. I've always been talented, but it was one of those things where I just decided to dedicate myself to this full on. And yeah. Awesome. So uh, where did your interest in art begin? Um, <laughs> it's a funny story. I always tell my kids this, but it's one of those things where I think I was always talented. I just never focused. And um, it came down to, I was almost held back in kindergarten because they were worried about my motor skills and um, I wasn't coloring the lines and, and that sort of thing. That was the story I remember hearing as a kid. My mother denies it to this day, but that's the story I remember being told when I was younger. Was I, you need to, and I remember the exact picture that I colored everything in the lines. And it was since then, I've always known that I've had this talent and I've always had this ability. And it was sort of what I was known for being younger. And, um, and as I've grown, I was passionate about it, but then at the same time, um, I went to college, that was a different matter. So, yeah, and then I basically, I was in college, um, you know, college is time for self-discovery, and I sort of got burned out, and I didn't know if I wanted to be an artist, and I didn't know if I wanted that ability. You know, I didn't know if I wanted to that to be my thing. Um, so I dabbled in, history and philosophy and you know all the stuff I wanted to learn and didn't draw for like the last three years of college and then even years a few years after college and started working as a professional and um, then one day I just started drawing again and funny enough I was better than I was when I was in college and a lot of that was my mind matured and when you see things differently uh, putting things together it's a little easier so but long story short I just always had this ability. <laughs> so how did you get into the education part of it, becoming an art teacher? Um, I think I originally wanted to be an art teacher when I was in high school. Um, I had some really good teachers. Uh, they inspired me to, to really want to, you know, I really liked learning the mechanics of it and learning to express the mechanics of making art and being inspired, inspiring others to make art. Um, so when I was younger, that's what I wanted to do. I went to college to originally study art education um, and at the same time study fine arts. And I, you know, and, and so from there, it just sort of fizzled out, like I said. And then I came back to it when we moved here to the UAE. And it was a great opportunity because I was working in higher education. And uh, my wife um, said to me, you know, you have the opportunity now to, you know, maybe doing well enough where you don't have to worry about working right away. Figure out what you want to do. And so while she worked, I drew eight hours a day. <laughs> you know, I just drew constantly. Um, and, you know, I was, and so with that, then I also got my master's degree in education because there was an opportunity to get a free master's degree at the university where she worked. And so I got a master's in education and I started, you know, talking to my daughter's school that she was at. and. Uh, and so they offered me the opportunity to be a student teacher. And I was like, oh, excellent. So I was a student teacher there. And then when it ended, they offered me um, maternity leave uh, to cover maternity leave for a teacher. And then when the art job opened in elementary, they knew I was an artist and they offered me the job. So this is your second career, technically. This is my second career, definitely my second career. I've had many forays into many fields in my life, but this is my second career, I would say. Awesome. So what are your favorite things to create? Oh, well, I love, I love geek subjects. Like I like doing comic book art, as you can see on the walls here. Um, but I also like horses. I love painting animals. I think um, my least favorite thing to paint is people. Uh, I hate, I, I just, I, I, people are very difficult 
as an animal, I think. I look at them like animals in some way because they all have similar facial structures and stuff like that. And it's just, it's harder to to gauge that, to grasp the, the essence of a person as opposed to an animal or, you know, comic book related stuff. I, I, I find it more fun and more free to make art the way I want to make it and it's enjoyable. We were speaking earlier and you mentioned that you are um, what, what do you call it? The, the fine artist? Yeah, a fine can, artist. Can you tell us a little bit about more of what that is and what the difference is, especially in this digital age? Um, I would say a fine artist, and I would say the difference between digital and um, physical art, you can still be a fine digital artist and a fine artist. I think a fine artist is someone that studies the, the mechanics, the basics of art, and masters the basics of art. So, such as learning to draw form, mastering perspective, you know, draftsmanship, all of those things that the components of drawing well and creating, you know, solid art, um, composition, all that stuff is what an artist would do. Um, I think a lot of times, uh, and I mean, I probably will upset some <laughs> some artists when they hear this, but. Um, I think oftentimes conceptual artists, for instance, conceptual artists are the ones where you'll see like splashes of paint on a canvas. And sometimes that masks their lack of skill sometimes. Um, I know that there are plenty of conceptual artists that are amazingly talented draftsmen and can draw and are, you know, technically good artists, but they don't show. Um, a fine artist, I think, is somebody that, that, that looks at the classics and appreciates the classics and and stays true to some of those, the essence of what art is. Um, for me, I've always struggled with the idea of conceptual art, and I don't, I have trouble calling that <laughs> art sometimes. There are some things I get, some things I don't. I struggle with it, though. Do you do any digital art? Um, I was originally doing that, and then I, I've, always, I had, I've always had a problem with digital art in the sense that I, up until recently when NFTs were created, um, I always felt like, you know, you're not getting my an original piece that's yours, you know, with digital art, because I can just make as many prints as I want on the piece. And so it's different between getting a tangible canvas or a watercolor or something that I've done that's physically yours. You have the only copy of this. You know, that's the difference. So the NFT now gives um, digital artists that ability to give somebody something unique. They're paying for something unique. They're owning that file. Um, but I think that when you're looking at art itself, like I've always loved the idea of giving a, a customer or a person a physical piece of art that is unique and only they have. So when, when you say NFTs, because it's something that I've been trying to understand myself, yeah. um, saying that the person owns the actual file, but yeah. for me it's just like, but I see it on Instagram. Yeah. So can you explain, how, if, if you know about how is it, Unique. It's unique in the sense that it's sort of like getting a certificate of authentication um, from the artist. So, you know, it's obviously a non fungible transaction, I think is the term it's called, um, where a graphic artist could have the unique original file of that piece of art. Like, who, what's the artist? Beeple just sold a piece that is a a collection of 5,000 pieces of art that he turned into something and he sold it for $68 million. Um, it's insane. He's automatically one of the most valuable living artists in the world. Um, but at the same time, when you buy that file, you are the sole provider of that file at that point. It's sort of like, you know, if I give you a canvas, you know, if there are copies of that canvas out, you still own the original mm -hmm. and you own the piece that my hands have touched in that regard. Um, so there's a difference. Like it's the same thing as like you look online and you can see a Van Gogh, but I'm the owner of that Van Gogh, so I'm special. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like it's 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 that sort of thing. In the art world, selling art in general, I, I sort of I I try to stay out of that because I think it jades my artistic sensibilities as an artist because I feel like it in in general, like when you sell art, the artist never gets the residual. So say I make you a painting that sells, I sell to you for $5,000. Okay. And let's say I get famous and someday that painting is worth $5 million. Do I get any of that as the artist? No, I get none of that. 
So to me, how the art world works with the investments and that sort of thing is, I don't like to pay attention to that. It's just like, I like just making art, feel like it great, and then I don't ever want to know if it's worth more money. I don't ever want to know if you resell it for more. It's just, it's better that I don't because it will, you know, it will bother me if that's the case. So in respect for art in and of itself, could you just give us a, a glimpse into um, the process or how long some, like maybe pick one of the pieces on the okay. wall that you have and, and just tell us a little bit about how long it took you to create it. All right, so for instance, I mean, I can tell you, each of these has its own story. I think that me as an artist, I can tell you what I felt, what I, what I was thinking as I was doing these things. Um, my earlier pieces, I would say that it took me longer just because I wasn't as good. But then when you're looking at a lot of my horse art, they take me a little longer because I think that there's a lot of anatomy that I have to study. Um, my finals piece that I have here took me a lot longer because I think that was where I really figured out realism. And I figured out anatomy and lighting. I think I mean, you can look at it and suddenly, I mean, if you look at that finals versus that Iron Man, piece, for me it was, there's was definitely a markup where I'm starting to, there was, this thing that I think was Leonardo da Vinci that they used the term sapete vedere, and is to know is to see. And as an artist, it's important to see, to be able to see things in its essence. And so when you're looking at like this piece and you're understanding how light interacts with texture and how light interacts with metal and how light interacts with you know plastics or all that sort of stuff, and being able to correctly represent that, I think is I, I evolved in my art when you're looking at that. And then when you're looking at some of my other my other horse art that I've done, it's definitely evolved. Um, just recently on my Instagram, for instance, I posted um, a comparison piece of a piece of an incredible Hulk painting that I did last year versus what I did just a couple weeks ago. And the progress was, you know, was astounding in that regard, as far as by my standards go, because I think when, if you're an artist, you need to put in 10, those 10,000 hours, 10,000 hours of mastery that they talked about. But the, the crazy thing is, is that might be 10,000 hours of watercolor that I've just done, but it's also, then there's 10,000 hours of acrylic I have to put in, there's 10,000 hours of drawing figures that I have to do, there's 10, you know what I mean? So it's never ending. And as an artist, you have to constantly humble yourself and look at the things that you can't do well. And the things that you can't do well, then you have to be honest with yourself and say, I need to learn this. And you have to go back to be a student again. And I think that that is something that all of us as creatives or all of us that want to master anything have to do. You have to be humble. You have to find your weaknesses and make those into strengths. With that being said, can you give three tips to artists in general? Okay, um, three tips. First thing is to see. You really have to become a student of observation. When you're, I mean, and you can do that anywhere. When you're in a restaurant, you're looking at like, how is the light hitting the silverware? Or, you know, what does the lighting look like? What does it do to someone's face? You know, and then you start looking at, you're comparing objects and size and distance. And as an artist, you're always looking at that. You're always a student with your eyes. Um, second thing is, is to practice. That's the most important is to practice. You have to practice constantly. It's just like any other thing, whether it be a sport, an instrument, um, any activity, you have to practice. If you don't practice it, you'll never master it. You'll never develop it. Um, and the third thing is, is to challenge yourself. If you're doing the same thing over and over again, not trying anything new, not pushing yourself to another level, you're not going to grow. And I think that as an artist, your, your responsibility to yourself as somebody with this talent is to grow and to push yourself further than you ever thought you could go. All right, so during COVID, um, what did you do during COVID? Let's just talk about that. Well, being locked down, I couldn't be in the classroom and I, you know, it's. Honestly, like to keep myself from going insane, art saved me. Um, it was one of those things where like, I was occupied all the time, I was creating. I had to do that because if I didn't do that, 
I, I don't know. I, honestly, I probably would have fallen, you know, into the madness that so many people are struggling with right now. Is finding something creative is so important. Whether that be, you know, I had Rachel's uh, cousin and her husband help me build, you know, cornhole sets in the back, and he did projects creating my website for me and. You know, I, you know, focused on my art. I was painting at least two paintings a day during COVID. It was just constantly working. And it made the time go by fast. And I didn't feel the effects that everybody's talking about, the feeling of isolation and, you know, and feeling like this dread upon me because it's just creation is, is like that for me. It's just, I'm, it's my own little world and nothing touches it. And it felt great. And COVID was easy in that regard. So... Where can we follow you? Um, I have an Instagram, uh, Bearded Brush. Uh, that's my Instagram. That's primarily where I post all of my art. Um, it is, yeah, that's pretty much it. I have a website as well, the beard, thebeardedbrush.com. Um, but Instagram is primarily where you see all my new stuff come up. And um, I'll be posting more videos and stuff like that as I go. If somebody did see a piece on your Instagram or uh, wanted something created, how could they go about uh, contacting you to have a piece made or purchasing a piece that you already have? Um, you can start by PMing me or DMing me or whatever, PMing me on uh, Instagram and just say, you know, hey, I really like this piece. Is it available? And if it isn't, I have prints of everything that I've done. Um, but I'm more than happy to talk to people about commissions and quoting their prices. And it all depends on the size, what they're looking for, um, detail work, all that sort of thing.